You have an accident in the right berm on the inbound East Shoreway at Dead Man's Curve. You also have another wreck reported, 71 northbound on the ramp to 480 west, and then 271 southbound, all full slow from Cedar Brainerd all the way through Rockside Road. Police are out with several accidents off to the side between Chagrin and Rockside. Experience, resources, and results. Elk and Elk, serious lawyers for serious injuries. Jennifer Rose, WTAM 1100 Total Traffic.
Trivisano. His mind is a terrible thing to waste. WTAM 1100. Mike Trivisano. This is Dennis Kucinich. I'm uh, here in your headquarters at WTAM 1100. Elizabeth and I are substituting uh, pinch hitting for you today, but thank you for everything that you do for this area. As we give thanks in the Cleveland area, we're thankful for Mike Trivisano. And I want to say that we're also thankful for our uh, renowned guests today who have been uh, very important in the transition in the medical community that uh, starts to look at whether or not the degenerative de- diseases that so many people are afflicted with, if they can be controlled or reversed. And that's the discussion today when we're talking about the impact of diet, uh, nutrition on the state of health that people find themselves. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the last three hours, we've had uh, Dr. Colin Campbell the author of the China study, Dr. Caldwell Essesnin, uh, the a person who worked with Cleveland Clinic and some uh, path-breaking work in the, in the uh, uh, breast cancer clinic, as well as the work that he's doing now in uh, looking and doing research on what can be done uh, to, uh, using diet and nutrition for cardiovascular disease, and Dr. Neil Barnard of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Uh, he's uh, written several books that look at the choices that people can make so that they can improve the quality of their life uh, and their health uh, using uh, diet. So uh, we have a, a panel now for the next hour. Uh, Elizabeth Kucinich uh, uh, is my co-host. Elizabeth is the uh, Government Affairs Director for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Uh, by way of disclosure, she works with Neil Barnard, uh, and uh, we're glad that uh, uh, Neil's here today, and Elizabeth, you wanted to uh, begin. Go ahead. Yeah, I want to um, say we've got uh, five DVDs to give away. There's a documentary called Forks Over Knives, um, and it outlines the work of uh, Dr. Colin Campbell and Caldwell Esselstyn and has and features Dr. Barnard in it. It's a wonderful documentary, Taking the Country by Storm. Um, if you would like to win one of these copies of this DVD, please be one of the first five callers to dial 216-578-1111. 216-578-1111. Uh, that's Forks Over Knives. And uh, now let's, uh, we have a panel for the next uh, 48 minutes. Let's go to our callers, and you have a chance to uh, talk to uh, one of these uh, important researchers and physicians. Uh, let's start with uh, Sigmund in North Royalton. He wants to talk about oils and fish oils and things like that. Yes, my question is uh, about the uh, uh, gentleman brought up about oils not being good for you. Uh, is he including krill oils and uh, 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 salmon oils and uh, flaxseed oils as well? What about that, Dr. Esselstyn? Yeah, I think that uh, we pretty well have, have, have found that the, uh, the oils, uh, generally speaking, are the ones that tend to injure the endothelial cells. Specifically and the ones he's talking about? Well, uh, uh, I'm going to have to say right now that I'm not aware yet of one that has passed muster uh, on this, and uh, I haven't, I don't have in my head one particularly on krill, krill oil, but the, uh, but when you extract these oils, they're always going to be either monounsaturated or saturated, and those have, those oils have been shown to injure the endothelial cells. Yes. Well, when 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 my cardiologist ta- tells me to take five or six grams of fish oil a day, uh, yeah. I feel that's a lot. So if that's injuring my, uh, my arteries, or, or uh, is that good or bad? Then You know, when I- you're taking, what, what, they're, uh, what they usually are doing is you, when you're taking a fish oil, you're taking fish oil to take a, get the benefit of what we call omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3, where do you think the fish gets the omega-3 fatty acids? From eating green leafy vegetables. So while our preference would be to probably have more and more of those green leafy vegetables and also some flaxseed meal. Uh, I'm not going to get in a wrestling match with your cardiologist about the fish oil because I think that in that modest amount and taking a, uh, in that uh, in pill form uh, is uh, something that certainly is acceptable. Uh, well, let's, I, go ahead. Uh, follow up. Yes, this is Colin Campbell. Yeah. Can I pipe up here and just add something to what Dr. Essel just said? You know, in 2006, there appeared in the side of the literature, good place, a summary of some 59 studies on these omega-3 
uh, oils uh, over the last whatever it was, 10 years or so before that. And their conclusion was, uh, it was really very thoughtful, uh, comprehensive thing. Their conclusion was that these oils have shown no evidence of uh, returning heart disease, cancer, or diabetes. And as a matter of fact, uh, there was an additional study involving some 3 million person years. It's a big study uh, looking at the question relating to these oil, the use of these oils regarding diabetes. And it turned out that each incremental increase in the consumption of these supplements actually was associated with an increase in risk for diabetes. Uh, Dr. So I, I uh, Barnard, did you want to add anything there? No, I think that sums it up pretty well. Okay, let, let's go to... Um, Another caller. We've got uh, Jim in Olmstead Falls. Hello. Uh, this is for any of the doctors. I, uh, there's been an advent over the last two years for commercials on blenders in uh, Whole Foods. Uh, number one, is that a good thing? Um, is that something that uh, could benefit most people? And uh, is there a... Uh, um, you know, is there a benefit to doing that person? That's one of the questions I have. Any Anyone? Uh, go ahead, Neil. Um, so are, we're talking about using blenders and juicers and that kind and of smoothies thing. Smoothies, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. yes. Well, sure. I, I, I think so. I mean, when, when I was a kid growing up, uh, I would go down to the kitchen. My mother would be pulling bacon out of the fry pan with a, a fork and putting it on a paper towel to drain. And you could almost hear your arteries snapping closed when you looked at what we were eating for breakfast. So if, if you, instead of that you're having a breakfast smoothie with soy milk and bananas and, and healthy f- things, that's, that's a really good choice. Now, a lot of people will say, wait a minute, don't juice your carrots, eat the whole carrot. And they're right because you're going to get the fiber. But on the other hand, these things introduce variety, and they're, they allow us to really enjoy vegetables in a way that we might not otherwise. So, so I'm all for it. I mean, is there a better um, – I mean, so the, when you pulverize it, you have to use a whole food. Is that what we're looking for? Uh, not mean, necessarily. Uh, not necessarily. There, there are juicers, for example, that will extract the juice, and, and much of the pulp they will discard. And so you're, you're losing that. Um, so they can work in, in both ways. I uh, I guess my my recent uh, uh, the awareness of the downside of of fructose has led me to be uh, a little cautious. I I think that if, as Neil points out, if you're just having it as a vegetable or you're juicing it, that's you're losing the fiber. And and as, as he indicated, it's preferable to chew it. But my concern with the smoothie is that when people have put in the vegetables and they find that they're that's too tart. Then in addition, they'll start throwing in uh, an orange, an apple or two, and some bananas. And apparently what happens when you blend this up so such high speed with those knives, there is concern that <clears throat> you lose the benefit of the fiber uh, mm-hmm. of the vegetable. And also, you lose the benefit of the upper part of the gastrointestinal tract, which is apparently is very important. Chewing is supposed to be very, very beneficial. And at the same time that you chew, you are absolutely now... Uh, sort of uh, soaking this with uh, salivary gland juice, which is very beneficial. And when those fruits are so highly uh, blenderized, uh, they may actually now no longer have the sugar bound to the fiber in the fruit, which is the way it is when you're eating it. And once that sugar is free, especially the fructose, and you just dump it past your mouth into the stomach, that fructose going uh, in so fast really uh, uh, can be very deleterious, not only to the liver, but also, again, to the <clears throat> lining of the arteries. We're going to go to a traffic break right now with Jennifer Rose, and we'll be back with their questions. Thank you. This traffic brought to you by Allstate and Wayside Furniture after Thanksgiving giving event. You have an accident reported, 71 northbound on the ramp to 480 west. You're also looking at some brake lights heading out of downtown on I-90 westbound. And then 271 southbound sitting in a jam up Mayfield Road to Rockside Road in the local and express lanes. Police are also out with several accidents off to the side between Chagrin and Rockside Road. Experience, resources, and results. Elk and Elk, serious lawyers for serious injuries. Jennifer Rose, WTAM 1100, Total Traffic.
The Mike Trevisano Show. Reputable. Reliable. Regrettable. WTAM 1100. Good evening, Cleveland. This is Congressman Dennis Kucinich here with uh, co-host Elizabeth Kucinich. Pinch hitting for Mike Trevisano on this uh, day before, the day before Thanksgiving. And wishing all of you and your families a wonderful Thanksgiving. Lots to give thanks for. Today we're giving thanks for three amazing guests who have had an impact on health care and getting people more aware of the choices they make with respect to food that they eat and the effect on their diet, uh, the effect on their health, and also the bigger question. If you have some kind of a condition, if you have cardiovascular disease, if you have uh, uh, arthritis, if you have uh, any kind of uh, cancer, uh, can any of those disease processes be reversed and, and when? Uh, the number here is 216-578-1100, uh, 216-578-1100. Uh, call WTAM, and uh, we'll go right to the phones right now. Uh, we've got, actually, you want to talk about the reach of this station? You've got Joe calling from Alaska with a question about diet. Go ahead, Dennis. Joe. Hello, Dennis. Greetings. How are you, sir? Very good. I wanted to ask briefly with the effect of uh, what your experts over there feel about a high uh, salmon-based diet, which is different from the salmon oil-based diet that was referred to by your prior caller. Here in Alaska, many of our outlying coastal communities rely on salmon and other cold water fish for part of their indigenous lifestyle. And I'd like to know what your experts feel about that. Based on these, are not fish that are found in the Great Lakes, but are, for the most part, pretty wild and pretty clear. And I know you have a lot of guests calling. I'll just sit back and listen to your comments. Thank you very much. Okay. It's a uh, great show. Thank you very much. Uh, Do- Dr. Esselstyn, do you want to take a shot at that? I'm going to let Neil, Neil go first because he, he's the salmon guy. Go ahead, Neil. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, when, when people are eating salmon, um, particularly folks, whether they're in Cleveland or, or so forth, I'm, I'm setting aside for a moment people who are who are. Uh, in an indigenous situation where this is pretty much all they have to eat. But when a person is eating it by choice, they're picking it up often because it's got the good fats in it, the omega-3. But then they get disappointed because they learn that only maybe 15 to 30 percent of the fat in any given fish is actually omega-3. All the rest, that other 70 to 85 percent, is not omega-3. Well, what kind of fat is it? It's a mixture of bad fat that's saturated fat and various other unsaturated fats that aren't necessary. And the problem with that is Atlantic, Atlantic salmon is about 40% fat. If it's Chinook salmon, it's about 50% fat. So you're eating effectively something just so filled with grease that it's extremely high in calories. Every last gram packs nine calories, and, and that's the problem. So that's why sometimes salmon... Uh, advocates tend to have trouble with their waistline because they're really getting this big load of fat and every fat gram packs a lot of calories. How much, how much of these diets are, are idiosyncratic, though? I mean, you know, there are some people who, if they ate a lot of uh, fish products, they, their weight wouldn't fluctuate that much, and others would. Uh, I mean, is it, is it axiomatic that if you consume these oils uh, that you're going to end up with problems uh, with your cardiovascular system? Uh, S, do you want to take that one? Well, again, it's, it's, what it, we're talking about, at least from, from a vascular standpoint, is all experts would agree where this disease has its inception is in these tiny little delicate cells that line the inside of the artery that I mentioned earlier today. These are the endothelial cells. And the, the more hits that these cells take, the more injuries they sustain and the more likely one is likely to end up with vascular disease. So the question of, uh, 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 I guess that comes back a little bit, Dennis, to what we somebody else called earlier on, on uh, but the question of moderation. And I, I just want to emphasize again, I wrote a chapter in my, my book, uh, in, a, in the spirit of full disclosure, I did write a book for the public, uh, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And in my book there is a chapter entitled Moderation Kills, what moderation means to most people who are listening is how many of the bad foods can I have and still get away with it? It's like saying, how close can I walk to the edge of the cliff 
We don't know where that is for every individual per person, but so, we do know so this. So that way it may vary. We do know this, that everybody, if they stop and don't, don't injure, then they don't have the problem. But some people will be more injured by one fish than others would be. D- Dr. Uh, uh, Campbell, uh, are you still with us, sir? Yes, I am. Uh, do, do you have any comment on this, uh, the, the question of, you know, at what point? Is there a tipping point in terms of uh, consumption and the initiation of a degenerative process? I, I look at it from uh, two perspectives. One is, and I'm just adding to what uh, Dr. Bernard and Dr. Essen said, uh, there's another feature of fish that we need to be cognizant of, and that is that they don't really contain the really good stuff that's in plants. They don't contain the complex carbohydrates that, for all sense and purposes, they don't contain really the antioxidants. And that's, that's, uh, that's a really pretty serious question. So I would uh, suggest that on the basis of the evidence from that perspective that we not use them if we don't have, if we don't, if we can avoid them. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at the relationship between fish consumption, especially different kinds of fish as it relates to many outcomes, certain kinds of heart disease and other things, um, you know, especially the whole fish in the ocean and so forth and so on, I, th- I think we, can, uh, we need more research on that. I hate to kind of say that, but that's, that's an old mantra we say in research all the time. But we don't, we don't have really robust results showing that we can distinguish between one kind of fish and another all that much, I don't think, unless... Unless Neil or S want to say something about that. Okay, well, let's, uh, you know, I appreciate you uh, helping to at least bring some clarity to that. Let's go to uh, uh, Jim in Westlake, who says he has a veggie family. Uh, Yes, good evening, and uh, thank you for the show. I uh, know from following this uh, area for over 20 years that you've got a rock star panel here, so um, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to talk. In particular, I'd like to start with just a quick testimony 23 years ago. I had the benefit of hearing Dr. Esselton talk at the Cleveland Athletic Club over a luncheon. Matter of fact, I remember that day he brought his own salad and uh, impacted me a great deal. And, and I'm one of the few people who have probably been influenced by hearing a presentation by this. Our family went pre uh, vegetarian about 23 years ago. And in particular, I would comment that myself, I lost about 10% of my weight, went back to my high school weight, high school waistline. Blood pressure went down, cholesterol went down, been very healthy, and and now as I approach 60 years of age. um, But the thing in particular, my wife and daughter suffered from migraines, periodic, monthly almost, and they went away. So so I think there's some amazing benefits. And and one of the other things I point out, the only person I know that we've ever influenced by our lifestyle, because this is a hard sell, is my son-in-law, who I, I think was influenced by the fact that as he looked into it himself, he, he's an avid athlete, and he came to realize how many athletes, especially marathon runners, triathlon people, were vegetarians, and that greatly influenced him. And to the extent I think more celebrities and athlete, athletic-type individuals perhaps offer their testimony and talk about this, it might have a great influence on more people exploring and trying the vegetarian lifestyle. Uh, I, I do have one quick question, if I could. You know what? Could you hold that question? We're going to take a break for the news, and we'll come right back to you. Four eighty eastbound at a crawl Valley View Bridge to Warrensville Center, then four eighty westbound your slow go two seventy one to Broadway and pass that between Tiedemann and seventy one. Two seventy one southbound stop and go Mayfield Road through Rockside Road. Police are also out with several accidents off to the side between Chagrin and Rockside. Experience, resources, and results. Elk and Elk, serious lawyers for serious injuries. Jennifer Rose, WTAM eleven hundred total traffic.
The Mike Trevisano Show. Discreet and professional. News Radio WTAM 1100. Good evening, Cleveland. Uh, this is Congressman Dennis Kucinich. I'm here with my co-host, Elizabeth Kucinich. We have an amazing panel. It consists of three of the most significant researchers and uh, individuals who are physicians and caring for people who are trying to change their diet uh, on their way to better health. We have Dr. Uh, Neil Barnard on the phone from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn from Cleveland Clinic, and also uh, the uh, renowned researcher from Cornell, uh, Dr. Colin Campbell, the author of the China Study. I just wanted to point out for those of you who are listening and might be interested in more information on the books that uh, this panel has written, Dr. Colin Campbell's book is The China Study. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn has written on uh, how to prevent and reverse heart disease. And Dr. Neil Barnard, the 21-day weight loss kickstart, uh, even has a a website, 21-day, that's 21-day, kickstart.org. We we should uh, uh, say that this panel and their uh, participation in this in the, Trivisano, in the Trivisano show this afternoon uh, has uh, really been very beneficial for our greater Cleveland area, and we want to thank them. We have a number of calls here that we'd like to go through uh, on, our, on our way to the end of the hour. Back to one. And excuse. Going back to one. Yes, we have, uh, we're going to go back to a caller. I think uh, hopefully he's still with us. Line five. Okay. Jim, are you still yeah. with us? Hello? Okay, ask your question, Jim. We, we came back to you. Thank you. Yes, my question deals with uh, the earlier comments on olive oil. Uh, admittedly, if you're eating a vegetarian diet and you're getting the leafy greens, salad is a big part of, of what you will eat. And I always like the olive oil. I must admit I was not aware of, of some of the concerns about olive oil that were mentioned earlier. So just wondering if they could maybe say a little bit more about the use of olive oil and what other ways you might prepare heated food where you've used olive oil in the past and what you might use on salads as a substitute. Uh, Neil, do you want to answer that? Sure, just just real quick. Uh, first of all, for all the people who are hearing this for the first time, this doesn't mean that we should be eating chicken fat instead. Um, when If you're eating animal fat and you go to vegetable oil, that's a really a step in the right direction because you're getting away from all the saturated fat. But what we're talking about is going a step further. So if I make a salad, and I don't want to grease it all up with all kinds of fat and oil, what I'll do instead is maybe some balsamic vinegar, apple cider vinegar. Or if you go into the Asian aisle at the grocery store, they'll have seasoned rice vinegar. Give it a try, and it's it's a light, very delicious taste. Sometimes I'll even just slice open a, a lemon and squirt a little bit of that on there. And then the last thing is um, if you look at the salad dressings in the store, you know they've got like 45 different ones on the shelf, you'll discover that about a quarter of those are fat-free. So read the labels and, and you'll see there are a lot of, lot of great choices out there. You're not going to go hungry. Okay. okay. Uh, Dr. Esselstyn, did you want to? Uh, well, I, I think that was a wonderful question because it's what are you going to put on your salad because you are eating a lot often. You're eating wonderful, nutritious salads. Uh, one of the favorites that uh, that we have is uh, if we take some hummus uh, without tahini and without olive oil, but hummus, and uh, then add a little bit of uh, balsamic vinegar, uh, a little bit of mustard, and then a bit pinch of uh, orange juice, and uh, you've got something that will steal the eye right out of your head. Well, I think we know what we're going to have tonight now. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's go to uh, John in Westlake. Uh, John, are you still with us? John in Westlake. Gentlemen are having a good evening. Go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, a while back you had a caller call in, and he was concerned about early cancer detection. Uh, I'd like to ask the uh, panel there if uh, they are aware and if they, if they have had any uh, inputs uh, with the AMAS test. Go ahead. Any any of the uh, panelists? Yes, any, anyone. Does anyone there know of the AMAS test? How do you spell that? What do you mean? A, I'm not A-M- AMAS, and it refers to the anti-malignant anti-body uh, test. It's a test that is done by Onco Labs in Boston, and it will detect cancer in a person's uh, system. It doesn't detect, it's not specific, but it will tell you whether you have cancer in your system or not. 
as, as early as 19 months before any kind of other techniques. This test has been uh, developed and it's been tested and by, by uh, G, uh, what is it, G.D. Searle, one of the uh, pharmaceutical companies. Well, you know, I, I, if the panelists uh, uh, aren't familiar with that, I would just, I would just like to say that the, the one thing that this uh, panel is focusing on is prevention. So if someone even would have the slightest tendency towards any kinds of cancer, I would ask, the, this, if I may take the liberty of asking this question to panelists, uh, uh, advancing the question that this caller has, uh, what, can, what can people do? What kind of, what's the best diet to have so you prevent cancer? And, so and, these and, are, and I wonder yeah, as well, you know, maybe we could look at um, what Dr. Campbell did in, in the China study and really sort of have a story from China coming out here. Yeah, maybe. that would be good. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Campbell, could you... Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd like to make a comment on that because we, we know for most of these cancers that they tend to have a long lifetime from the time they're first conceived, if you will, until they actually express and we can get them diagnosed. And and, and, and so go through all those phases, science has discovered various sundry uh, events and activities that uh, sort of indicate that it's something is quite not quite right on the way to cancer, but not really cancer. We call these things pre-neoplastic. And sometimes uh, we've overemphasized this kind of thing because these things come and go, and sometimes they're somewhat predictive of eventual cancers. I mean, the PSA test for prostate cancer is sort of illustrates this not completely uh, but we, we see these kind of things I know in the case of liver cancer you can see things very very early on that look like uh, this is predictive of the cancer and, and to some extent they do but we have to remember at least from the experimental point of view and that's what I'm focusing on uh, these, the, the progression of these things on to the ultimate lesion it seems to be really pretty remarkably controlled by various nutritional conditions. Well, so let's I, go. Let, let me let me ask this. Uh, you have people who are listening to this show, and they may not feel quite ready to make a diet change. They may just say, you know, yeah, I know I should eat this and not that, but I'm not really ready to go there. Is, is there any way to make it easier for people? Uh, you know, having made a diet change myself, I can tell you I jumped right into it. But Neil Barner, do you have any suggestion you could make about what, what makes it easier for people to make a transition in their diet? You know, it's the most common question we get because everybody says, I would love to be free of my diabetes. I'd love to knock off some weight. Or one of the big things that we've seen is arthritis, where people hear that your arthritis can go away or improve. And everybody says, man, I would love to be able to grip a, a tennis racket again. So... At the same time, they're, they're thinking, I don't want to make an enormous diet change. How do I do this? I break it into two steps. And the, the first step is you don't change your diet. What I do is I take a piece of paper, and I write breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack on it. And the goal for the first week is just to fill in under each heading foods that you know you're going to like um, that happen to be free of the animal products and don't have a lot of the oils in them. So you think, what could that be? You're not actually changing your diet. You're just testing things out. So uh, oatmeal, well, that's kind of bland, so I've got to put some cinnamon and raisins on top. That's all right. Uh, blueberry pancakes we talked about earlier. Okay, f fair enough. Lunchtime. Instead of uh, meat chili, I could have the bean chili. The, the whole idea here is just to, to, to not begin a diet until you found the things that you actually do enjoy. We're at an Italian restaurant. All right, I'll top my spaghetti with something healthy instead of all the greasy sauces or I'll go Chinese or Japanese or Mexican. Once you know what you like, then step two is I do what I call the three-week kickstart, and that is 21 days I'm going to do it without the animal products, but I'm making no promise about day 22. And if a person really does it, what they discover is their chest pain improves or goes away, their diabetes numbers are getting better, they're losing weight, their digestion is finally sorted out, their joints feel better, migraine headaches in some people go away and then after three weeks you're a different person and you just don't really want to go back to the to the things that got you into trouble so i break it into those two steps and for most people that gets them in a position where they can talk about long term then well uh, damarison uh, from hiram is on a diet plan did you have a comment or question of any of the panelists well, first of all, I have to rave on. I adore everybody on the panel, including the congressman and his beautiful wife. I was a uh, vegetarian for decades, and uh, three and a half years ago, my daughter entered 
introduced me to the E2 diet of Rip Ethelson. And uh, it didn't take long at all for me to discover that that's the way I should go. And here's my question. All my life I've had allergies, bad allergies, with even shots at times and all this sort of thing, very allergic to grass, which, of course, cows eat. Since I've gone vegan, I have no allergies, whatever. I can hold cats which used to be real anathema to me. I can uh, handle all dogs. I can go around people mowing grass. And I'm so happy uh, to have other people have this same result. It's a very common experience. It, it's, I'm so glad you raised it because there are other people there with, with their tissue box nearby and they're, <laughs> and, and, and they're thinking, what can I do? Um, you know what? I, I want to resonate with you. I had a cat allergy, too. If I would pet a cat and then I would touch near my eyes, I would get this feeling very rapidly of allergy. Yeah. When I went vegan, completely stopped. Uh, there are so many people with asthma, same story. Now, here's what we think is going on. And I have to say, we think is going on because nobody has really proved this for sure. That something about the dairy proteins uh-huh. seem to cause people to be more sensitive to other allergens. Uh-huh. So when you take it out of the diet, all these other things are worse. Uh, all, all the things that have been worse start getting better, and so you're no longer reacting to the molds and the mildews and the, oh, and yeah. the grass. Molds. So that uh, seems to be the issue. It seems to be getting away from dairy that does the magic. Oh, books and libraries, you know, the whole, the whole picture. I could go in a house, I didn't even know there was a cat, and sit in a chair, and I'd be crying and sneezing. And I am so happy, and I'm grateful to all of you. I've read all your books, and Dr. Barnard, your uh, blueberry pancakes are served in my house every single Sunday morning. <laughs> That's great to hear. I'll be right over. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. Jim, Jim is calling from Iowa. He, he says he has a different view on this topic. Let's hear it. Go ahead, Jim. Do you have a question for one of uh, the panelists here? Senate fan, so it's, uh, you know, I'm <laughs> very honored to be speaking with you. And as to your panel, I was wondering, yes, I have a very different point of view. Um, I belong to a group, and I suspect you may have heard its name, the Weston Price Foundation, which very actively actually endorses eating animal products of all kinds, and we believe that uh, the key is very much in the selection of products from healthy, properly raised animals. Um, so we, we take a very actively different uh, tack on nutrition. But what I was wondering, and I wanted to raise as a point just to see if your panel had any uh, comments, um, I'm very much a crusader for our group and groups like it, although I don't think there are many that are really like it, um, but our group trying to work together with those who take the vegetarian and the vegan points of view because I think that our group actually espouses a lot of the same social justice factors, you might say. Well, you know, the thing that, w- the the value of this panel is we have uh, Dr. Campbell, who uh, started out as a dairy farmer. Uh, exactly. Would you like to respond to uh, uh, Jim from Iowa, uh, Dr. Campbell? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it requires a long, long answer. Okay, okay, you've got about a minute before we start to okay, move just, to wrap the show up. <laughs> yeah, I grew up on a dairy farm, and we had grass-fed animals, and uh, it went on and finally got to my research. The first research I did I was using the protein of milk from cows that were grass-fed, and we got the results that we got that were so spectacular. And so I have come to the view it's actually the nutrient composition of these foods that matters most, that best describes their effects. Well, actually, I would contest your findings, but we, you know, with only a minute left, my point is that there are a lot of people in society that are not going to give up animal products no matter how much research you throw. Well, that, that has to do with, you know, whether we are uh, really serious about our health is from my perspective, and also uh, one's taste preferences can change. Dr. So Campbell, what, what, could, you, what, what, could you just uh, tell us how many uh, different uh, variables and people took part in your China study? Well, it was, uh, it was large in one context, but not necessarily so large in another. It, was, it did involve 6,500 people from whom we actually collected blood, but... I mean, there are bigger studies in terms of numbers of individuals. It was large, on the other hand, in terms of the number of regions that we were comparing. That was unusual. Yeah, that's what I mean. So. Yeah. Well, let's, we've got, in the time that we have, what I'd like to do, and let's start with Dr. Campbell, if you could just give a brief summary of, of why people should, uh, why you would recommend people start thinking of alternatives in terms of how to achieve health through uh, uh, a diet that is plant-based. 
Well, I speak from my own experience, as everyone knows, I think. I started out from a farm and was very much into that kind of thinking and went through the years and had a rather large research program and did all kinds of research from different perspectives. Ended up uh, changing my own uh, lifestyle, my family's lifestyle, they followed suit. And then I came along and uh, met uh, people like uh, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Bernard, Dr. McDougall, and many other clinicians who who actually were using this idea, had come to it on their own, obviously, and got these remarkable results. So I'm just simply looking at the science that we did that sort of, in a sense, predicted this kind of thing, and then meeting these other gentlemen, these colleagues, who actually were doing it and getting these results. Dr. Dr., uh, Dr. Esselstyn, could you sum up uh, the importance of, of your work in terms of moving people towards prevention based on their changes in their diet? Well, first, Dennis, let me just say uh, how much I admire <clears throat> the other two gentlemen who you have on uh, today. Uh, what has been so exciting uh, t- to me is that the idea that uh, uh, probably w- right now about 75 to 80 percent of these common chronic killing diseases uh, really need not happen. What I would suggest that you mentioned earlier about how would you get people to make these changes, if people will just look at their own family tree, how many people have had cancer in their family tree? How many have had... Uh, cardiovascular disease, how many have had diabetes, and realize it's not the luck of the draw. It is not the genes. It is really uh, how, we, uh, <clears throat> how we deal with this from a nutritional standpoint. And one of the things that we really have to do, we have to get medical schools to start teaching nutrition. Okay, Dr. Uh, Barnard uh, of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, did you have any final uh final comment here. Yeah, I, I think we turned a corner. Um, a, a couple of months ago, I turned on the television, and I was watching CNN, and President Bill Clinton came on the television. And Bill Clinton was known for one aspect of food, and that was he used to jog to the nearest fast food chain and eat burgers. And he was known for always tr- struggling with a weight problem. Well, he had gone to Chelsea's wedding, what was that, maybe six or eight months ago or a year ago, and he was trimmer than ever. He looked young. He looked fantastic. Why? Because he had started a plant-based diet. And the reason he did it is because he had read Dr. Ca- uh, Dr. Campbell's book, and he read Dr. Esselstyn's book, and it said that you don't have to have heart disease because that's what he had been battling. He well, did it to save his heart. He lost weight. He looked terrific. And I think we've turned a corner, and now it's kind of mainstream. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barnard and Elizabeth. Uh, you? No, it's just been great to be with you all, and let's think about the children now. Let's have a look and see how we can really help the children who are in school so that we don't have to have the next generation suffering from the same kind of diseases. Thank you, Elizabeth Kucinich. This is Congressman Dennis Kucinich. Uh, we've been pinch hitting for Mike Trevisano. We've had a distinguished panel of guests here to talk about transitions to better health using diet and nutrition. Happy Thanksgiving, Cleveland, and all of the listeners here. It's uh, great to be with you, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you.